Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Tartan Slam seminar series. Today, we are very excited to have Professor Andrew Davison give a talk titled Graph-Based Representations for Spatial AI. Uh, Professor Davison holds the position of Professor of Robot Vision at the Department of Computing, Imperial College London, and is the director of the Dyson Robotics Lab. He also leads the Robot Vision Group at Imperial College. Professor Davison's research touches on all aspects of Visual Slam. He has developed many pioneering real-time vision systems, including MonoSlam with a single camera, Connect Fusion for RGBD sensors, and more recently, frameworks using event cameras. In addition, he has demonstrated practical use of a wide variety of 3D representations, from sparse point-based maps to learning-based abstractions that are capable of dense semantic understanding. His research has also explored efficient probabilistic inference for localization and mapping, such as filtering, smoothing, and distributed message passing. Looking forward, his future mapping position papers advocate for a more holistic view of intelligent devices with an emphasis on the co-design of computing hardware, sensors, and algorithms. Outside of academia, Professor Davidson has significant experience with commercializing products in industry, such as with Dyson, and he is also a co-founder of SlamCore, a startup that specializes in applied spatial AI solutions. Professor Davison, we're all looking forward to your talk and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the uh, re really nice in introduction and for uh, in inviting me to, to be part of this uh, really good series. Um, yeah, can I just check the sound is coming through well? I can hear it. Yep. Perfect. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll explain to you what this uh, title means uh, th throughout the the talk. Um, but let me just uh, start by, um, yeah, kind of get, getting some assessment of where, where we are now really in this whole area. So I've been working on, on SLAM with, with Vision for, uh, well, I, I, over, over 20 years, over, over 25 years, um, and have seen that go from just kind of a, an idea, at, uh, you know, uh, some algorithms that we are playing around with all the way through to now actual real products that, that you can buy that actually do visual slam. And interestingly, these are in several quite different categories. So I think we were always originally motivated by robotics and we have robots now in the form of, uh, so robot vacuum cleaners. This is the, the Dyson 360i that I was personally uh, involved in, uh, in working on which has an omnidirectional uh, visual slam system. There are some other robot vacuum cleaners that also do visual slam. Drones is, is another area that there are now really sophisticated uh, visual slam systems in, in drones from companies like DJ, DJI or Skydio. But then there are also these other categories of, of products that you wouldn't necessarily call robots, but interestingly, they have a very similar uh, kind of capability in, in visual slam. So things like headsets for AR, and, and VR from, from multiple uh, companies, and then SLAM capabilities inside smartphones uh, for, for you know, various uh, applications, maybe some of which haven't even been uh, thought of yet. But essentially, you know, smart devices that need to know where they are in, in spaces need, need SLAM. But I think it would be fair to say that these are kind of relatively preliminary products in, in terms of where I, I, I kind of think and hope we, we might get to. So one, one way of thinking about that is in terms of gradual increasing levels of, of performance in, in SLAM. And, and, you know, I've really been through all of these uh, stages in, in the research that I've done. So initially we were focused on building sparse feature maps of, of scenes where the main goal was to enable localization through a map of lam, uh, landmarks. Then we, we worked on dense, uh, mapping systems, which we're now starting to try and capture full, fully kind of detailed geometric information about, uh, of, of, about the scene around a device. And now, you know, something that we're very much still currently working on is semantic understanding of scenes. So turning geometry into, into meaning. So clearly, as you add those levels, you can make products that are more and more capable. And I think the current products, you know, mainly they're about robust localization. That works very well. And now they have some level of dense mapping and scene understanding also kind of coming into products. Um, but, re you know, recently I've been using this term spa spatial AI. And, and for me, this isn't really a, 
a new thing. This isn't like a layer that you build on top of SLAM. To me, it's what SLAM has always been about and has gradually been evolving towards. So I, I still kind of think of something as a SLAM system, even if it's doing dense mapping and semantic understanding. But I think this term spatial AI maybe maybe just makes a bit more clear what 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 the ambition is here, which is a, you know a, a general important part of the artificial intelligence of, of, of an embodied device, which is all about under, understanding the scene around it in, in a useful way. Um, so what might that enable in the long term? I think you know much more ambitious products, uh, which we can we can't build yet is, is, is kind of the key point. And, and I should say these are just concept pictures, not representative of, of what anyone is actually trying to build in, in a product. But, you know, general household robotics, a robot that could really do all sorts of general tasks in, in the home, or maybe that, that kind of augmented reality product that everyone is kind of thinking about what, that, that could provide general smart overlays, memories of everything that a person does. Uh, you know, as, as they're going about their daily life. But, but importantly, these real products, as well as, you know, requiring capabilities that are far beyond things we can do at the moment in terms of SLAM and scene understanding and, and other aspects, you know, like display, for instance, in, in, a, in an augmented reality system or manipulation in a robot. Um, besides them still being too difficult to build technically, they also have to be good products. They have to come in under really, really tough constraints so for instance, this, for this to be a real kind of use all the time product, I think it would have to have the same sort of size and weight as a standard pair of glasses and probably also have all day, all day battery life. So these are really tough constraints. And I think a point I would like to make is, I think we're still gonna be doing this for a long time yet. So here's just a little picture that, that shows, you know, current products over here uh, and then this kind of chasm of probably orders of magnitude of improvement needed in sort of, uh, you know, performance versus efficiency. Uh, we've got current research prototypes, you know, in, in my lab and, and others um, trying to move across here. But I think we're going to be working on this a long time till we get to this full spatial AI uh, capability. So that's something I've been uh, thinking about a lot. And as Eric mentioned, um, you know, a, a kind of long form of, of, of my uh, thinking, which I'll, I'll kind of summarize in this talk is, is available in uh, these future mapping papers of which there's two uh, at the moment. And, and the, fir the first one is really thinking quite generally about what spatial AI is. And in particular, what is the computation and the representation that is required to, to get to spatial AI and some ideas about how we might actually get to this level of efficiency that I, th I think is uh, important. And then also has some uh, hypotheses about maybe the general character of spatial AI. So even though some of those products might be quite different, I hypothesize that they might have very related uh, requirements in, in terms of, of spatial AI. And, and another paper I've been involved in uh, recently, so this was, this was a collaboration uh, that I was involved in uh, uh, last year, uh, we wrote this paper about re rearrangement, a challenge for embodied AI. So I was I was interested in this because it's really trying to motivate interest in in really difficult AI problems. So so for instance, you want a robot to tidy up a kitchen. What what does that? What 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 kind of capabilities are needed to do that? How how would you specify that kind of task? How would you judge whether you'd been successful in in, in a task? Uh, like that, so that, those are the kind of questions we're, we're asking in, in, in this paper and, and really trying to drive ambition a bit higher beyond a lot of work, I think, in AI, which is focused on you know, very local problems or problems where the certain assumptions are made that, that just make them, I think, a bit too easy. Let, let's try and lift our, lift our ambition a, a bit and, and try and solve the really hard problems. Um, okay, so just back, backing up a little bit to a bit of uh, a little bit of history and, and, and really returning to, to that picture I showed earlier of SLAM capability building up in, in, in layers. Um, so, you know, I, I, I worked on sparse SLAM initially. So through, through my PhD in, in the 90s, where I built a visual SLAM system that ran on a robot. But then in 2003, I managed to, to make a single camera SLAM system 
that worked just with it with a single handheld camera. It worked in, in real time. And, and the main goal was to accurately localize this camera at frame rate 30 hertz as the camera is moving around in a general indoor scene. And it did that by building this map of sparse uh, landmarks. So, so that was, was uh, Monoslam. The, the next kind of, um, I, I, for me, sort of big step into something diff different was when we start when we were working on dense slam and we were also very involved in that so particularly around sort of 2010 2011 uh, Richard Newcomb at, at that time was a PhD student in in, in my lab and, and we but he did systems like connect fusion and and DTAM so this is elastic fusion which is a bit more kind of recent uh, system uh, from from our lab I'll just show you this video quickly but this is building a real-time dense uh, scene uh, model. So this is using the 3D representation of, of circles, which means it's the scene is made up of millions of tiny little oriented uh, disks. Uh, and then we are doing real-time camera tracking against that map as we build it. That's what makes it a SLAM system. So here we've got input of both our RGB and depth and the particular uh, aspect of, of uh, elastic fusion is that it was able to do loop closure, which which connect fusion wasn't able to do. So you'll see that every so often you get these rather big corrections happening to the map when you come around and reobserve something that you last saw a while ago and realize that things aren't quite aligned. We have a mechanism to, to fix that by, by kind of optimizing a, a, a deformation graph. So this is now capturing really nice detailed uh, geometry in, in this scene, but this is still just uh, geometry. So th therefore the next step is to think about semantics and trying to give uh, meaning to, to a scene uh, reconstruction like that. So clearly to actually be useful to, to a generally intelligent robot type device, we're going to need to know what things are. So the, the first, uh, well, uh, the, the first sort of so explicit system that we built in that in that direction was called semantic fusion, which actually took the pretty straightforward approach of running elastic fusion to build a dense map. Every so often applying a, a CNN to the input frames, which which was a CNN which had been trained offline to do semantic segmentation. So take in the pixels of an image and output a per pixel estimated label of, of the of the class of, of, uh, of object that's present there. And then what semantic fusion does is, is uses the, the geometry of the SLAM system to fuse all of those labels together into a coherent um, 3D scene. So if you like, what we're doing is taking all of the semantic labels from images and we're kind of painting them onto the 3D reconstruction such that each circle of the reconstruction is storing a distribution over labels where the highest weighted uh, one of those is our best guess of what the type of uh, object is present at that 3D uh, location. So if we, we look at the, the, these results, I mean, this is just one snapshot I, I grabbed. The one on the left, I think, is, is ground truth. So don't pay too much uh, attention to that. And I can't actually quite remember what the difference is between these two here. But, but the, main, the main point is you know, th this achieves a re reasonably good result. It's pretty good at labeling some things. So gray is wall, white is floor, blue, blue is chairs. It's ki kind of noisy. I mean, people have done be better than this uh, th these days. Um, it's kind of noisy. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's missing some things. And, and another th thing is it doesn't really have an idea of what different objects are here. So, so all of these chairs are just sort of painted blue there's a kind of chairness to this whole region, but we don't have the concept of, of an individual chair. So those are pro problems to, uh, to, to attack. But, but the other kind of problem is just that this is a really sort of heavyweight systems. And, and I would say pretty, pretty much through this whole journey from sparse slam to semantic slam, we have kind of thrown more and more computation and representation uh, and communication at, at, at these problems. And we've been able to do more but at a cost of now a system that's quite big, quite complicated. So don't worry about the details of this picture, but this is just a sort of rough system level diagram of everything that's going on within the system like 
like semantic fusion where you've got things here like a labeling cnn you know this is a kind of tracking optimization um yeah th th this might be something like map smoothing there might be a relocalization module so if you've ever built slam systems you can probably imagine some of these components so this is very complicated and it's also quite heavyweight i mean it was running uh when when we did it on a you know a cpu gpu desktop type of system there's kind of huge representations in this system you know images and you know, maps of millions of surfers there's tons of data being kind of pumped around and probably you know hundreds of watts of power being used to actually run this system in real time so you know that's quite far away from fitting the sort of constraints that we might need for these real products so so really we, we want to, you know, this sort of summarizes what I think we want to attack a system like semantic fusion. We want to do much better than that, but we also want to do it with much less, uh, you know, much more efficiency and much smaller requirements. So I think there are two kind of key lines of, of, of attack here. Uh, one is to think about representation. So this is really the kind of algorithmic question of, of how do we look at some of the representations being used in a system like this, can we make them smaller, more, more optimal, and maybe more designed towards what we really need out of this system? So do we really need a map of 5 million circles or do we need a representation that focuses more on what's important? The, the second uh, kind of line of attack, which I'll come to in a minute is, is hardware and the actual kind of computation and sensing hardware that we would actually use to run a system like this. Um, so I should say, you know, an important thing that's happened in in slam as in every a, a, a area of ai in the last few years is is you know the arrival of of deep learning and if if we look at how semantic fusion works there's already some elements of deep learning in there of course the cnn that that is doing the the labeling for us and now you know people are looking at nearly every part of a of a complicated slam system and thinking can i replace this human designed module with a deep learning module or can I even replace the whole thing with, with a deep learning uh, system so you know I'm my, my position on that is is that there's a huge sliding scale between you know end-to-end -end learn algorithms where you know you might have a single neural network representing the whole of a system trained end-to-end -end, and then at the other end a fully human designed algorithm and remember this is where we started and very much what we were doing 100% until just a few years ago in, in, in SLAM. There's a huge sliding scale in, in between these things of ways that you can kind of design systems in, in a modular way with elements of human design, elements of learning. So it could be that the, the main structure of the system is human designed and certain modules are replaced with networks, or it could be that the whole system is a neural network, but the sort of structure of that network takes in interesting aspects of human design, you know, like, like a CNN, for instance, is a kind of a, de a design choice that's made based on some human assumption about, about the structure of the problem. And there's many other examples like that. So uh, any, anyway, I, I think most of us that are actually trying to make slam systems that work now are interesting operating points somewhere along this uh, sliding scale. So both, both in academia and, and very much in industry as, as well now. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the work we've done on, on representation in, in, in the last few years. And here, you know, deep learning has really come to, to help us because what, what deep learning is really good at is looking at a lot of data and trying to find the sort of structure within that. And methods such, such as autoencoders enable us to, you know, look at dense data and try and compress that down to a sort of bottleneck and to find a smaller number of parameters that really describe the range of, of interesting things that are going on. So we had a series of papers, Code Slam and later Scene Code, which were about using this sort of autoencoder idea to compress the variation in scenes, and in particular in, in sort of view-based Slam representations of, of, of you know, views and depth maps and semantic maps and, 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 and so on. So the kind of key idea is that if, if you, uh, you know, a camera, for instance, cap, well, might capture a depth map and, and the raw representation of that depth map, for instance, if it's VGA resolution that has 300,000 parameters for the depth of every pixel. But actually, if you point that camera at many real 
scenes, you'll find that actually the kind of range of, of, of variation that you see in real scenes is much, much lower dimensional than that because real scenes you know, are made up of coherent objects. They're not random point clouds. And particularly if you, you know, focus on something more specific like indoor scenes, there's even more specific structure there. So in CodeSlam, we train a, a network on, on, a, on a data set of indoor scenes. So actually a synthetic uh, data set. And we, and we learn a sort of low dimensional embedding for the variation that happens in depth maps. And what that then allows us to do is to build a SLAM system, which is a multi-view optimizing SLAM system, which optimizes the poses of cameras and then codes which generate these depth maps. So you, you, you optimize the codes until you get overlapping consistent depth maps. And that is a, is a, is a way to do joint, jointly optimized uh, dense, dense SLAM, which was always a hard thing to do otherwise. I'll just quickly show you this video here which is from scene code which was our sort of slightly later um uh, kind of uh extension of that where we show that we can also use the code idea to generate semantic maps so this is really attacking one of the problems of a uh, of semantic fusion um by by saying that if you've got you know separate uh neural networks that are generating semantic predictions from a scene and you want to fuse them What's, what what uh, semantic fusion does is literally, you know, per pixel, it just sort of averages these independent noisy predictions uh, from individual views. Whereas in in scene code, what we do is is we we've learnt a code that 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 kind of captures the coherent structure of typical semantic maps, and then when we jointly optimize a code uh, to to be consistent between these multiple overlapping views, we can actually get a much better fusion because the code does, doesn't like these sort of noisy re reconstructions it much much prefers kind of coherent uh things so so this is a a, a better way to, to to do a dense fusion and and the output of that is is therefore this sort of uh you know real-time uh, monocular dense and semantic uh slam system that produces, you know, maybe slightly low resolution type of re reconstructions and, and but with very sort of coherent uh, labels. And so actually, I think this is a very useful type of representation for a robot, which has this sort of compression uh, bit built into it. Um, uh, yeah, so, so in fact, if you're interested in playing around with those sort of ideas, I'd recommend that there's an open source project we've released called Deep factors which uh, is a full implementation of the code slam idea embedded in a general factor graph uh, uh, formulation. Uh, so the other kind of thing to, to briefly tell you about now is some other very recent work that we, we've done which is also about using neural networks to kind of represent whole scenes. This, this one works in quite a, a, di a different way. So this is actually closely related to NERF and papers like that, that you might know about as um, neural implicit representations. So actually what this system IMAP does is to train a single simple neural network in real time against the, the sequence of data captured from a moving depth camera to represent a, a scene in, in this implicit neural representation, but very different from NERF where if you know anything about that, we, you know, it, it, they, they take hours or days to optimize a neural network against a set of images. Here, we're actually incrementally training a neural network as a scene representation in real time. So here, we're actually moving this depth camera around the room. So it takes about three minutes altogether. You know, this is running in real time. Sometimes you see it slightly sped up. And, and so this kind of image here changing is the neural network gradually being, being optimized. And so as it sees more and more data, its representation gets better and better. So you, you see these kind of weird uh, shapes hanging around in the sky to start with, but as the camera moves and, and looks at more of the scene, gradually this representation gets, uh, gets sharper and sharper. And this is also a very nice kind of representation that's got compression built into it. And in fact, this is a really small neural network. It's only got about a megabyte of, of weights to represent this, uh, this scene, both, both in terms of uh, 
of uh, shape and, uh, and color. So there are a number of kind of things we had to do to get this work so fast, to work so fast, such as keeping a kind of keyframe representation of the scene and then using sampling of points to train the network against. So these red dots that you can see are the samples that we choose on each frame. So again, for computational reasons, we can't show the network all of the data all of the time. But if we smartly choose what to show it, we, we can get something that works very well. Uh, let me just show you this part of the video where we actually, you know, show the reconstructed scene in 3D. So you can really see that we have captured the, the main shapes in this scene very, uh, very effectively. Okay, so in terms of representation, the other kind of key idea that we've always uh, had around and, and tried to work on is <coughs> um, to be more explicit about focusing our representational uh, capacity on the things that we think are really important in a scene. And if we're a, a robot or a device that needs to do intelligent things in a scene, the most important things in the scene are usually the objects. So we've built a sequence of systems which are basically object SLAM systems. And, and the first one of these, and really a, a prototype, uh, was called SLAM++, which we first worked on in, in 2013. And so this is a system where we have a depth camera that's brought into this, into this room, uh, but it has prior knowledge that certain types of objects are going to be present. And in particular, certain types of chairs and tables. It recognizes instances of those objects, estimates their 3D pose, and then directly builds a map at the level of those objects. So really the map here is like a pose graph of the positions of these objects. So it's a little bit like going to the original feature-based slam systems, but where now each feature is actually the sixth off position of, of an object. So this is a really kind of efficient and useful representation of, of a scene. So slightly more recent work, the, the, this one called More Fusion is, is very much the same sort of idea. So it's we've got a camera observing a scene with the assumption that we've got strong, accurate prior models of some of the objects we expect to find in, in this scene. But here we're dealing with them with the more more difficult case, let me just show you the video. Uh, so the more difficult case where those objects might actually be jumbled up and piled on top of each other and you know, occluding each other and so on. So our goal is to take several views of, of, of this scene and then try and find you know, the jointly most probable estimates of the positions and, and the identities of the objects in, in this scene. So this system works by, by a combination of kind of volumetric reconstruction and then pose estimation where it's trying to estimate poses for all of these objects such that obviously they can't intersect each other and satisfy some other constraints like that. Um, so let me just show you a demo of what, what we can do with that. So that, you know, the camera here is on, is on the, is on kind of the wrist of the robot arm and we show that if we scan this scene with, 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 with the system, we estimate the positions and identities of the objects, and then we can do something with it. So the goal here is actually to, we want to pick up this red box and place it neatly into the brown box. But in order to do that, it's first gonna have to move away a couple of, of, of distractor objects that are on top of the, of the target object. So the distractor objects, it, it picks up, it drops them out the way in, into this yellow bin and then it can pick up the object of interest uh, with a suction gripper here and then accurately place it in, into the box. So, so that's, that system is quite powerful, but clearly you know, its limitation is it re relies on you know, precise knowledge of, of the objects that it's expecting to encounter. So what if we don't have that prior knowledge? So at, at one end of the the other end of the scale, what if we have no prior knowledge about the objects here, but we do have a neural network which is at least good at, you know, finding proposals of what is an object. So here we're just running off the shelf mask RCNN, which runs on RGB images and gives us the outlines of things that it thinks are separable objects. So in this system, Fusion++, every time we think we've identified a new object, we, we, we are basically building a representation similar to SLAM++ in that it is, it is like a pose graph of these objects where the objects are the landmarks, 
but then for each object we have an individual volumetric reconstruction so it's like a separate little connect fusion type volumetric reconstruction going on for each object so that has a very nice generality we can deal with all sorts of different objects in this system but on the other hand we can only reconstruct the visible parts of, of the object so whereas if we recognize an object we immediately estimate it's we, you know we know its whole shape and we know where it is here we only reconstruct the visible parts of the object so the most recent piece of work we've done in this in this area called node slam i would say fall, falls somewhere between the the two so in this uh approach we're, we're assuming that we have some prior knowledge of, of the object so in particular we have class level models so in this system we've we, we've trained a neural network on certain categories of objects so mugs bottles bowls and cans so we have a database for instance of several hundred 3d models of of cups and bowls and cans and we've learned a sort of the shape variation of those particular classes so now what happens at runtime we we detect instances and we estimate what their class is and then we bring in our shape model and, and we've got a kind of code in that model which we can optimize so a low dimensional code that we can optimize which generates possible shapes of different mugs and then at runtime we optimize that code to actually find the precise shape of the object that we're looking at right now and then again, you know, we can turn that in, into a SLAM system. So this makes it a, a bit clearer in this example. So now we've got a moving camera observing this scene, detecting new ob ob objects, and then jointly optimizing for the, the motion parameters of the camera, the, the pose parameters of the objects, and then the shape, the, the coded shape parameters of, of, the, uh, of the object. So we just have a big factor graph where all of that is, is jointly uh, optimized and we can make this nice map and then again we can apply that to to a robotic application here so the camera looks at the scene it finds the objects it estimates their shape and then because it's estimated precise shape for these objects it can then grasp them very precisely so now having looked at this scene it's never seen these particular objects before but it can pick the bowls up in order of, of size from from big to small and therefore carefully uh, stack them uh, in, in order like this. So a lot of manipulation stuff you see is just about grasping, I think, but, but we, you know, we think that placing is also really important and to place objects precisely, I think you need a very good understanding of their, of their 3D shape. And I think this sort of work is well motivated for that reason. Okay, I'm going to keep keep moving. So we've just got a, a few minutes left, but I'd like to come come back to, to this picture and, and now talk about the second aspect here. So, so hardware. So I mentioned that when we implemented uh, uh, Semantic Fusion, it was running on a big desktop system with, with a CPU and, uh, and, and GPU. Um, but, you know, what, what's going on in, in hardware? So both in sensing hardware and in processing uh, hardware. So in, in general, I would say, I think we're in this interesting uh, time now where people are really starting to design hardware specifically for AI, for computer vision, you know, for, for robotics. So when I say hardware, I mean sensors and, and processors, because, uh, you know, we've basically been working all these years with hardware that was designed for other things. So we've used cameras that were designed for, um, uh, you know, photography and vid vid videography. Um, not necessarily what we really need for computer vision. We've been using processes that were designed, you know, as general purpose processes to do, uh, you know, word processing on or something, or GPUs that were designed for graphics. Okay, you can adapt them quite successfully to some things in AI, but they're not they're not necessarily the processes we really need. So, so you know, with with sensors, probably a lot of you have heard about event cameras. Um, so. You know, this is a different design of, of a camera that doesn't capture frames. It captures per pixel intensity differences with with, with timestamps. Uh, and, and we have shown how you can do slam like things with, with, with an event camera. So that's particularly interesting to me. It, it, you know, it's designed to be a bit like the human retina in how it works. And again, it's got this sort of important idea of compression built in. So an event camera 
it removes an awful lot of the redundance that the redundancy that's there in a standard video stream. So if you point a video camera at a scene where not much is happening, you've still got this huge data rate, whereas an event camera only tells you about changes. So that fits very much with my sort of instincts about, you know, compression and, and reducing uh, representation. So I don't have time to talk about the details of that now, but let's go on to the other aspect of hardware, which is processors. So I've been very interested in, you know, how, how are we going to get SLAM down to these tiny embedded sort of systems? And we, and we had a project called uh, the Pamela Project jointly between uh, uh, several universities in the UK, where we really started to think about this and open up this whole idea of co-design of algorithms and processes, which aspects of an algorithm like Connect Fusion, um, you know, need a huge GPU to run on and which aspects are quite, ha you know, can quite happily be pushed down to much smaller resources. And, and again, this power measure is really, really important in any, any real uh, product and especially any kind of tiny wearable device, you know, unless it runs at low power, it's completely useless. Um, so that kind of uh, gave us a lot of general thinking about that idea. And then, you know, that that's kind of led me on to more, more detailed thinking and, and in particular, you know, finding out more about what's going on in, in the processor world. And actually there's a lot of interesting innovation at the moment and companies that are actually designing completely new types of, of processors. So, you know, one crucial thing I think in, in the way that hardware has got to go is going to become more and more parallel. So we all know about, you know, Moore's law, uh, Denard scaling is, is another related term. So basically you can't just keep making CPUs that go faster and faster anymore. Um, which if we want to get more computation, we have to scale out in terms of parallelism. But a GPU is only one way to do that. And in fact, a GPU is suitable for certain things. It has massive parallelism. So a chip with hundreds of cores on it, but those cores have to be doing more or less the same thing that, and in a quite a regular pattern. That's what a GPU is good at. So there are other designs. So this, this is actually from a company in the UK called Graphcore that have a new sort of processor they call an IPU or an intelligence processing unit. And uh, so we really designed for AI workloads and it is a massively parallel chip, but with much more general parallelism than, than a GPU. So each of the cores on this can be doing quite different workloads at the same time. And then it has a very general kind of all to all interconnect structure. So these chips can be doing, the, the, the cores can be doing different uh, sorts of processing and then passing messages between them uh, on, on, on a really an, uh, whatever basis you, you, you choose to design uh, in your program. So it's basically good at graph-like pro processing. Um, so this is a visualization from, from Graphcore, which so their main application at the moment is accelerating deep learning in the cloud. And they can take a, a neural network, both at training or, or inference um, and compile all of the operations that that, that network needs to do into this graph-like structure. And, and they've come up with this nice visualizations, which look a bit like brains, I, I, I think, that show something about how, how that works. So inspired by that, and this is very much the, the stuff that's in the, the first feature mapping paper, I've been thinking about spatial AI and SLAM and thinking about the graphs. And actually there's lots of graphs, um, some of which we've already uh, talked about, but you know, the way we represent maps in SLAM often has this graph-like form of which places are close to each other. There's graphs present in the sort of regular structure of arrays of pixels in cameras and things like that. So we can find lots of graphs. And I think this opens the opportunity for thinking about how to implement uh, SLAM and spatial AI algorithms in a way that might map much more directly to, to hardware that's coming. So this could be both things like graph processors, or it could be you know, networks of many connected processors within a single device or even across multiple uh, devices. So this kind of graph-like pr processing, where as far as possible, you avoid you know, having a CPU here and a memory over here and shipping memory backwards and forwards between the CPU and the memory. What we want to get towards is kind of co-location of processing and the memory that it needs to work on, and then communication around that whole network via, via message passing. I think that's the character of algorithms, which might take us to these huge increases in, in efficiency, which, which we actually need. Um, 
So, you know, what were those algorithms actually look like? So if we talk seriously about graphs um, in, in SLAM or elsewhere and, and, and estimation on graphs, you're led towards probabilistic, you know, graphical models and in particular factor graphs are this formulation of probabilistic uh, uh, graph problems which we use all the time in SLAM and, and which are now very kind of well known. And, and if you're interested in knowing more about that, I highly recommend the recent um, uh, review paper from, from Frank Delert, uh, which, which uh, go, goes into a lot of detail there. Um, but, you know, how, how, what, what are we interested in then in factor graphs? We've got a set of, you know, observations and priors represented by these black dots, which are factors. And then we've got the things we're trying to find out. Like in SLAM, we're trying to find the positions of a robot as it moves. We're trying to find the positions of, of landmarks. So we need to do inference basically on a graph going from the measurements to the variables that we want to know. And there are many algorithms for doing inference on, on graphs, but, but there's one in particular I've got very interested in because it has this property of being able to be distributed around a graph and therefore to be mapped directly onto something like a graph processor. And, and that is belief propagation or more specifically Gaussian belief propagation. So this is in fact a very general sort of algorithm for solving inference problems on graphs by local computation and, and message passing. And I think it's been dismissed in, in the past or forgotten about, or you know, it didn't, it's not the best thing to do on a CPU or uh, so people didn't think about it, but I think where hardware is going we should really revisit the, these uh, these type of algorithms. And, and if you're, I've, so my second future mapping paper really talks a lot about that. And uh, I know I'm probably a little over time, but I'm just going to show you something very quickly here, which, which is a, a sort of online uh, uh, article that we are working on to kind of make make it much more clear why something like Gaussian belief propagation is the is possibly the, the, the right way to go. So I'm just gonna show you this bit uh, quickly. So imagine you've got a, a, a graph-like problem here. So we've got a set of nodes. So these might be you know, nine robots that are, that are in a room. And these robots can make measurements between themselves. So this robot makes a measurement of this robot and this robot makes a measurement of this robot. We want to estimate the actual best most probable poses of all of those robots on the basis of these measurements so we, so we can define a factor graph for this and we can do inference on that graph but here's how you can do inference with, with belief propagation you just have to pass messages between these robots and iterate a few times and so what we're showing here in, in the blue ellipses are the, are the estimates we're getting from belief propagation and in green are, are the, the estimates we would get by a standard uh, algorithm. And after a few iterations, we, 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 um, we can converge to, to, to the exact correct means with this fully parallel kind of distributed uh, computation. So that could be distributed across a nodes of a processor, or it could be distributed actually across many robots, for instance, that are communicating with each other by radio. So even, even more amazing to me, to me than that was when, when you try this. So what if instead of all of those things computing and message passing in parallel, they operate in a fully kind of ad hoc asynchronous manner. So every time I click this button, a random robot is sending a random message to one of its neighbors. And it takes a bit longer, but Gaussian belief propagation still converges in, in, in this case. So we need that one in the bottom left to receive a message. It's done that now. So if we just pass enough random messages, we, we still get this convergent behavior. And for me, that's a kind of magical, amazing property that, that means we can run these things on all sorts of different compute sub substrates. Maybe future processes won't even be fully synchronous, uh, but, but algorithms like this might, might still work. So for me, this is, this is a very promising and, and the kind of thing I'm putting a lot of uh, re research effort into now. Uh, so, so nearly finished, but just to mention, you know, the first kind of concrete thing that we really did with that algorithm was to implement bundle adjustment, the sort of classic uh, computer vision estimation problem. We've implemented it on a graph processor using Gaussian belief propagation and shown that we can be incredibly fast. So for instance, on a single IPU chip for a certain size problem, th 30 times faster than 
than Ceres on, 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 on a CPU, which is a, you know, highly well engineered, uh, you know, Google's, uh, uh, you know, graph optimization uh, library. Uh, and, and this is just, you know, some, some preliminary research code and it's already running really, really fast. So that's, that's very promising. Uh, yeah, and, and I've got a lot of on ongoing re research in, in, in this area, but I probably don't have time to talk about that now. So let's just uh, come to the end then and, and conclude. So yeah, the, the main message is this area of spatial AI research. I think there's tons of uh, interesting problems and we're going to be working on it for a long time. Yet yeah, some of the most interesting uh, uh, directions I think are efficient. 3D scene representations and systems for uh, incremental scene understanding, co-design of processes, sensors, and algorithms, and it, excuse me, int integrated graph-based algorithms for estimation and machine learning. And just to mention again, my 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 uh, affiliation. So I, I'm leading the the Dyson Robotics Lab, uh, which is an academic lab at at Imperial College, funded by and collaborating with with Dyson on on applications in in home robotics including scene understanding and manipulation. And then I'm also co-founder of, of, of SLAMCore, so this startup in, in London do, doing applied uh, spatial AI. So I'll finish there, thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, very interesting talk. Um, it's always great to hear your insights and vision. And uh, now we'll move to the Q&A and I think we already have one hand raised, um, Peng Yin. Uh, I think you're muted. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Andrew. So I just uh, have one question for the uh, the graph based uh, factor graph. I mean the graph uh, graph part because uh, so I think traditional uh, factor graph based uh, map optimization will be very limited to I mean just a purely geometry based method. I mean if the robots so if there is a multiple robot. And drive, they are driving uh, to a, a very large environment, so the, their scale is totally different. So, uh, so is, is there any is there any way we can using the uh, the Gaussian progression, the Gaussian belief method, to using uh, this method to optimize the graph? I'm not, not quite sure I've understood your, your your question. So you said the usual problem is what S scale or, or yeah. So, I mean, so the traditional photograph graph is uh, very limited to I mean local scale. Or maybe they are may, uh, mainly focused on uh, pure geometry based method. So in that case, if the area is very big, uh, it's more like a topological slam. So in that case, mm. uh, you cannot get very pure information. So in that case, the uh, the belief uh, progression based method. Do you think is there any advantage to use this uh, method? Um, well, well, possibly. I mean, I I kind of think you can model almost anything with with, with a factor graph, probably. So so. This question of whether it's just about geometry, I actually don't don't really think so. And, and and I'm also, you know, I'm thinking already about how to put more general sort of learning or things like classification and okay. uh, segmentation in into into factor graphs. Uh, so in fact, one one of the important things that we we're doing, you know, shown with belief propagation is that you can use robust factors and actually i have this you know this way of thinking about robust factors are things that can sort of switch themselves on and off and they okay. serve as sort of indicator variables really so you can have multiple hypotheses for instance for what type of object is present in a certain scene you can have multiple kind of possible factors connecting them you can run your system and you can see which ones switch switch on and off and are most probable given the evidence so so yeah there, there's a lot to do but but i i think there are there are ways to use fact, factor graphs in very general ways which might give us you know this full sort of semantic scene understanding that we that we need in, in terms of scale I, I i mean i think you know there, there's huge scale factor graph optimization that's already done isn't there i mean like google maps or something has a map of the whole whole world and i assume that the way they all line that up and make it consistent is something fully equivalent to a sort of factor graph uh, optimization yeah they probably do all sorts of smart things run at kind of multiple 
scales you know they've got other you know they've got data like gps obviously which probably binds the whole thing together quite nicely um but i i think scaling is is possible i think the scaling properties of doing it with belief propagation are in, interesting and uh, and 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 different i i think i think actually it takes us back maybe to trying to remember what what's important that actually for a robot navigating around in a space it may never need to have that sort of globally optimized map of the whole world what's really important is what's kind of nearby it at the moment and then how it gets to places nearby so so i think you you mentioned this this sort of metric topological character of scalable maps and I, and i and i think that's right and and i think that could emerge quite naturally actually with a sort of belief propagation style optimization in in that you you know you you focus your optimization on the nodes of the graph that are kind of near to you at the moment and then you don't worry so much about the stuff that's further away and that that will all stay connected it won't be sort of fully geometrically consistent but that doesn't actually matter probably until you get a bit closer to it again so so yeah i i kind of hope that some of the right properties will sort of naturally emerge by by doing it in in the in the belief propagation style uh so we'll move to some of the questions from online uh one related one is uh where do you see advantage of building a dense map directly versus uh, building a sparse, sparse map for tracking and building a dense map on top of that? Um, yeah, no, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a really good question. And, and yeah, we're, we've uh, certainly tried both ways of doing that. And, and yeah, clearly one reason to do it in the, in the layered way is that you know, sparse slam just works really well. It's well engineered, uh, you know, it's, it's um, had so many years of effort put into it uh, that it just uh, seems like a smart thing to do. And, and if you told me today, you know, build the best dense slam system that you could, I think the right thing would be to take, first of all, a really well working uh, sparse slam system to give you poses that you really trust and then layer the dense stuff on top. I, I guess the thought of going to a more direct dense representation is, is more long term. In long term, it just feels like the right thing to do to me, you know, it, I, I know that thinking about what humans do is not necessarily always a, a, a good guide in robotics and, and AI, but, you know, humans don't don't have sparse feature point maps of scenes. I'm pre pretty sure about that. We don't, we somehow don't need them. It seems more sort of pleasing and, and fundamental to sort of directly represent a scene in terms of, you know, the, the objects and the big structures that it, it contains. Um, and yeah, so this sort of model of a sort of set of objects in the scene joined up by a graph, which is more or less precise in places, that just feel, feels kind of right to me. Uh, and and, and I, th I just think it's very satisfying somehow to have you know, a, a single model of the scene. So your dense model of the scene is the, is the model that you use to make inferences about you know, how to avoid obstacles and so on, but it is also the model that you use to to track against and estimate your your motion and yeah it, st it still feels like the right thing for me to me in in the long term e even though yeah if you're engineering a system right now i i would go for the layered approach i think i, I hope that makes sense uh we have a question from martin adams in the zoom uh yeah, hi, thank you. Um, hi, Andy, good to see oh, you. Hi, hi Martin, yeah. <laughs> nice yeah. to see you. Very interesting talk, enjoyed it very much. Um, very you. impressive results, thanks. Uh, I guess I just have a very general question. I'm not really an expert on the visual <laughs> side of SLAM, so it's really good to see your results. But in terms of the semantic SLAM, for example, and even maybe sparser representations, in the past, we always used to talk about this big data association issue, measurement to state association. Is that now considered then just a trivial problem or completely solved with long descriptors or is it still an issue in any applications? Uh, yeah, good, good question. Um, yeah, so I, I know that we were very worried about that for, for a long time. Right. And then, well, for me, the, the biggest breakthrough was something like SIFT features came along yeah. and just showed that actually you could take two images of the same scene 
you know, taken three years apart with quite different lighting, quite different camera viewpoint. Uh, um, and you, you, you could match them. And that really surprised me. Yeah, because I thought we were going to have to you mm -hmm. know, do data association, you know, by the, you know, the methods we were doing, like J JCBB and, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know, making, finding a set of features that are geometrically consistent and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's true that I haven't thought about that much recently. And maybe, maybe that is just, just because those things do work really well. And, and then, of mm -hmm. course, you know, there's network based ways of finding correspondence now that I don't think they've blown sift away, but, but they're a little bit better, yeah. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's only worth the extra comp computation. Um, yeah, and then when it comes to associating objects and so on, um, you know, it would be still difficult to, you know, if you're in a, a room with a row of 100 chairs and being sure that you're matching the right one to each other. So you can easily definitely think of situations where that data association is is tough. Um, but I feel like in most natural scenes, yeah, maybe that is one of the problems we, that, that good progress has, has been is, is not, not made. Okay. I just asked, because we've looked at some scenes sometimes, just minutes apart and looked at, for example, mm. surf features or, or even the SF features and sometimes have found differences. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. overlap, but, you know, but yeah, interesting. Uh, sure, anyway. Yeah. But then, yeah, when you combine that, of course, with, you know, estimation of, of geometry and, you know, if you've got a good estimate of how your robot has has moved from some other sensors or something, then that that can often be enough, you know, to resolve sure. the ambiguity that, that you have once you put it all together. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Yeah. Okay, we'll go into another question from the chat. Um, someone is wondering about uh, how learning based methods are doing really well in certain tasks, such as depth estimation, semantic segmentation, feature extraction while traditional SLAM algorithm still relies heavily on um, some classical backend optimization. Um, so I think they're kind of wondering where on that spectrum you showed earlier, do you think mm. we should target or eventually uh, maybe converge to or target uh, and how to integrate these um, two, whether it should be end-to-end -end or um, on that? Yeah. No, I mean, who, who knows where, where, where we get to end-to-end -to -end ev eventually. Um, yeah, my, my probably sort of golden rule at the moment is don't when when there's something we understand really well how it works don't you know don't learn that <laughs> it seems a bit so you know like like basic camera geometry and motion or, or simple things about physics or something doesn't seem what what's the goal of trying to learn the, those things you know at best you'll probably get back to where, where you were maybe you use learning for the things that are hard to model so such as you know s s semantic identity or object recognition you know people had been trying to hand design ways to do that you know to tell the difference between a cat or a dog for instance you know it's very very clear now that that we didn't really have a good way to do that and and the learning methods are much better um but for something like yeah Opt, you know, estimating the motion of a camera by by matching features and so on. We've got really good mathematical models uh, for that. So, yeah, may, you use learning maybe for the thing of actually finding the correspondence between the patches because that's still a bit of a hard thing to to, to engineer. Um, but don't don't use it for the um, yeah the, the more sort of geometrical you know probabilistic estimation there parts of it because we, we've got very well uh, pr proven theories for that so so that that's probably my uh, my general view about that switching over more to the hardware side uh, there's a question about what is the limitation of uh, current graph core processors and I guess whether there's a, a roadmap for scaling that up or there may be some responsibility on the algorithm side to uh, maintain a smaller graph size um so i should first of all say that this kind of thing that we've been doing with graph process with with, with the graph core is you know we're the only per people only group doing anything like that i think with the graph core processors so so really at the moment um well i mean 
Graphcore is, is, is selling their processors, but they are, uh, you know, cloud-based accelerator chips for, for deep learning. That's what they're selling them as. But, but in my mind, what they've done, that, which is smart, is you know, there's a lot of companies making deep learning accelerators, which are quite specific to a particular network or, or assumptions, for instance. What Graphcore's chip is, on the, on, the, on the other hand, is a very general sort of parallel graph-based um, you know, com computer. And, and among the things it can do well are run uh, new, neural networks fast. And in particular, the more sort of unusual and, and esoteric a neural network design is, the more the advantage of a graph core will be, for instance, over, over a GPU. So on a, on a sort of straightforward CNN, which you could argue the reason CNNs are so popular is because of GPUs and, and they are the, the algorithms that run well on, on GPUs and GPUs are what's available. So a lot of focus on CNNs, but now I think people are getting a bit more interested in, in more um, un, unusual types of networks, obviously, you know, graph neural networks and, and so on um, should work much, much better on something like a, a, a graph processor than, than a, than, than a SIMD uh, style uh, GPU. Um, so, so my, maybe what I'm more concerned about with things like graph core is not, not so much are they going to scale up, but are they going to scale down? So actually they're very much scaling up now. now. Um, and actually, you know, they're not really selling single chips. They, they sell machines that, that have dozens or hundreds of these graph core chips in connecting into a graph of graph processors. And they're, they're trying to tackle huge problems like training these huge language models and things like that. I'm a bit more interested in will, will there be sort of embedded versions of that graph like processor, which, you know, you might be able to put into a, you know, a small robot or, or a mobile phone. And that doesn't exist yet, but I, I strongly expect if, if we can prove the advantages of this sort of processing, you know, for these spatial AI type of algorithms, then Graphcore or, or another company will, will hopefully move, move in that direction and, and make sort of embedded chips that have that kind of uh, design. Okay, thanks. Uh, we're over time now, uh, but thank you for all the questions and uh, thank you for the talk. Sure, no, a, a pleasure and th thanks for the uh, in interesting questions.